I'm going to give a little, a little uh, history, a, a special recognition uh, of some of our greatest partners. I'm really excited about that. To, and then I'll kick off a little bit about the changing landscape of aging, some new tools of discovery that we're really kicking off here at the Shiley Marcos Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and really leading the nation in putting forth some of these new technologies that, that we're very, very excited about. And then the promise of the future. So as uh, Emily noted, we were established 40 years ago, and it was really incredible. We were one of the first centers in the National Institute on Aging's Alzheimer's Disease Centers program, and that was Bob Katzman with his partner Leon Thal, and, and coming in, in part of that group is uh, George Glenner, Bob Terry, Nelson Butters, Sunal Sato, some of these really leading individuals in the field of Alzheimer's disease that then we build it on a seed like that, and it draws talent from across the nation to come be a part of that team. And that's what we've really benefited from, not only from the San Diego weather, but also because of the intellectual playground that this center is. And so I like to call it the neurosciences playground of La Jolla. Uh, it really is a fantastic place to work. It's incredible the kind of uh, talent that is here that we draw on as our center. When we put in our renewal grant, it's always a time to look back and say what is the impact that we've had on the field and this year was particularly inspiring we really found that our center has been the nidus of so many discoveries across not only in san diego at the salk institute the sanford burnham prebus uh, medical discovery network and the scripps research institute uh, but also across the entire nation they're using our samples they're using your samples that you've given to us and they're discovering off of the biofluids that you've given to us so including very importantly that that process of this of the lumbar puncture which everybody feels like oh that's a frightening procedure but in fact I think many of you have come up to us and said wow in your hands at the center that really that that process uh, is not nearly as scary as um, everybody had talked about, like in the ER, where you don't have a specialist doing the actual procedure. I think we take great care in making sure that that procedure is well tolerated and and um, and and done in really expert hands. So um, this is a, really our team from from the grant, and this is not meant to be fully read because it's a very busy slide, but it's really to give the concept that this is a very large team effort. Uh, this center has gathered some of the great talents of scientists and administration across all of UC San Diego and we all pull together uh, when we need to um, uh, put forth the science but also when we need to put the grant together. So that grant uh, that we submitted uh, back in June uh, was a thousand pages. It really talked a lot about all of our uh, uh, work and you know some of that is budgets and things like that so it's not all budgets, <laughs> but it was a thousand page submission um, and uh, and really it, it, it took all these individuals pulling together to do that and we were very delighted to get the news just a couple months ago that this center is going to be refunded at a higher level of funding than it has been in the past so, so we have another five years of plugging forward with this uh, support and we're very delighted we could not do this without you and your uh, efforts and really a, a major component of that uh, success with the NIH has been the fact that we have such an engaged group of partners uh, all of you here in this room really appreciate it so all of you deserve uh, kudos for that uh, so what when you think about the center what when you kind of step back and say well what what is this center uh, uh, is what's its main overarching goal? Well, it's to push forward the field of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And how do we do that? So, as you can see, we try to encapsulate it here in this slide to say that we need to uh, gr gather a group of diverse participants. Uh, and how do we do that? We do that through a, a core group of uh, faculty in the Outreach, Recruitment, and Engagement Corps. They're the ones that are also administering the quality of life programs and the, um, all the outreach and, and support group programs. So that work that you see Tracy Truscott doing and our great partners that we're gonna talk about here, that's really that, trying to uh, 
bring together uh, a diverse set of participants across the community of San Diego uh, to do what you're doing, coming into our center and being studied and, and engaging with us and allowing us uh, to test your memory as each year and to draw some fluids and sometimes even to get a little skin biopsy, which we'll talk more about because there's some very exciting models that we can bring to this uh, community of scientists. So in order to take all of that data uh, that we're gathering, uh, we need a data a biostats and, and um, uh, management core and informatics core that takes all that and makes sure that it's well organized and distributed across not only our clinical core, which is the characterization of your uh, diagnosis and, with, uh, and your progression or not, mm -hmm. uh, stability, uh, and, uh, and understand the uh, processes that are going on in the brain. That's used uh, in conjunction with the biomarker core where we are now going to be doing a lot more brain imaging of our participants. So uh, we're very interested in getting uh, direct measurements of what's going on in the brain, not only from a standpoint of the changes that happen with aging, but also the proteins that build up with aging. So that's the biomarker core, as well as the, the fluids that are collected by plasma or CSF. Um, and then the, a special core here at UC San Diego is called the IPSC core, this, the induced pluripotent stem cell core. That's a <laughs> lot of words, but it really is, I'll, I'll talk more in detail about it, but that's the skin biopsy uh, piece that, um, that I'm gonna be talking to you about. And then the neuropathology core, that, that really um, uh, special, uh, gift that our participants give at the end of life when they uh, donate their brains to us. So much is discovered at the end of that entire journey of testing and measuring and being able to look directly at the brain to understand what has been happening through life and what are the proteins that are going awry. And that's going to be, I think, a theme uh, also in this next iteration that Alzheimer's disease is just one of many of the um, of the uh, processes that's going on with aging. We're learning so much more about other proteins that are going awry. And for the m most part, if a person uh, is in their 80s or beyond, there's going to be more proteins that are uh, gathering there than just amyloid and tau that we've been talking about so many times. Other so that neuropathology piece is absolutely critical. So. Uh, signing up and, and, and ensuring that we do have a process for recovering the brain at the end of life is super valuable for the science, not only at our center, but across the entire nation. Because we're one of the centers, because we've been around for 40 years, it means we've had participants uh, who have passed on uh, and we've got them very well characterized and so that's hugely valuable for the science across the entire nation. Uh, most centers that started only five years ago, they don't really have a lot of autopsy specimens because they've only been following patients for five years and not many of their participants have passed on and given uh, brain samples. But in our center, we're really the place to go to because we've been around for 40 years. And so keeping that going is absolutely critical. And thank you again for all of you who have signed up and, and uh, committed to uh, giving the brain at end of life. So when we gather all that and with data, the participants, the bio samples, and to diversify this, we have a Latino core that is part of really ensuring that all of our processes are uh, culturally sensitive and also able to uh, uh, speak, uh, you know, bilingual, and bicultural team members, if you, as you've seen, uh, in order to make sure that we're representing the entire uh, diversity of our community and ensuring that we learn uh, very much about uh, not just the uh, processes of aging in you know white European individuals and in, uh, but also the entire diversity of, of our community so that's really uh, the the piece that we have and then and then we want to uh, support our research affiliates the projects that we fund we actually have specific scientific projects that we uh, take center money to support and seed fund it and almost always that seed funding grows into a scientific uh, program that the NIH says that's very exciting and powerful and then the NIH sends money to fur su further support it. So what we do is we plant a little seed and then the NIH helps water it and, and it grows into a large tree and, and really makes a major impact. So that's where we, we can really make uh, major direction changes in the science 
of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. The other way that we make a major, major long-term impact on this field is through our trainees taking, and that's called the research education component of our center. So we uh, identify talented individuals across UC San Diego and sometimes with our partner institutions, and we, uh, put the, we offer them uh, the opportunity to get specialized training and mentorship within our center. So uh, the leadership steps in. We know we're, uh, we're all aging, including the leadership here, and we want to make sure that we have a robust transition plan and making sure that we pass on our knowledge to that next generation of scientists. And that's a component of our grant to, to fund uh, the, uh, uh, the growth of our trainees into a diverse set of um, a new workforce in science and with the latest tools and the, um, the most um, uh, robust training for uh, the next group. And the other thing that we do special at this center in our research education component is that we actually, like what I said with the NIH with a little bit of seed funding, we give each of our research education component trainees a, uh, about $30,000 to start off a research project. So it's really exciting to see them have that um, uh, launch pad of actually doing, not only just learning about Alzheimer's research, but actually having some money to uh, start off on a project that will launch a career. And it's incredible to see uh, how many uh, kind of lives and careers that has changed. We've, uh, we've been able to keep our uh, scientists uh, in the academic field because so, there's so many draws out into private industry or wherever and it's kind of hard especially in San Diego to make a life uh, in academics because you're not getting paid those industry uh, uh, salaries but once you kind of see the impacts that you can make here I think people say this is more important than money and they stay within the academics and uh, the nice thing about my role dual role as lead of the ADRC and also director of the the Department of Neurosciences is that I can identify that uh, I can help take that talent and 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 get them placed into the department where they can uh, further their careers. So it's a really exciting synergy. I'm just just honored to be uh, uh, part of it and uh, and to have my fantastic partners Doug, David, and and this whole team. All right, so that's you've kind of seen a subset of our staff, but we've really got a, a fantastic. A dedicated group of individuals that are just fully uh, getting uh, life satisfaction out of the kind of impacts that we're making and the partnership with you all. Um, and then as I mentioned, we're, we really made a push to ensure that even though we're here in La Jolla where it's not necessarily the most diverse uh, neighborhood <laughs> in, uh, in the world, uh, but we are in San Diego where, uh, where there is a huge diversity of participants and we want to represent that entirety of our community. But in fact, even when we started uh, really making a push for more Latino recruitment, uh, I, made, I made many forays down into Chula Vista where some partners of ours uh, reside and uh, I saw it's about a 40 minute drive in if the traffic is good. So I mean, so I could really see that it was going to be a challenge to ask uh, our community in the South Bay next to the border to come all the way up to La Jolla for their science. So in, so in fact, uh, we set up a satellite center in Chula Vista at the South Bay Latino Research Center where we can have participants uh, do the full set of battery of assessments right there in their community. So that's been a hugely helpful boon to, to increasing the diversity of our population. And so we do outreach events down there and we also do uh, uh, community appreciations, bilingual community appreciation in the South Bay. And just to show the kind of impacts here, I don't know if it shows very well on this slide from so far away, but what you can see here is the Latino recruitment from 2017 to 2019 in the top bar there, where the green uh, bars are representative of uh, new Latino participants. And the uh, bottom bar is, the bottom graph is 21, 2021 to 2023, where you can see a massive increase of the, of the proportion of green in that uh, recruitment effort. So you see that our efforts really are paying off in diversifying our cohort. And we will continue those efforts. 
So looking at the outreach, recruitment, and engagement process, we this is a, uh, a core that really is about uh, increasing our enrollees not just not only the individuals that are doing what you're doing which is every year coming in for testing but also individuals in the community that say maybe I don't want to be tested every year but I am interested in being a part of your center and to hearing about research opportunities that are out there so we would we have a, a kind of a, almost a little a low touch approach to still broaden our impact uh, where we where we enter the patient's information into our registry and then we um, allow our partners and they they give permission to be uh, contacted by our research partners so that they can participate in some of the science uh, so we do it seek also to engage new partners to increase not only the diversity of ethnicity and race but also socioeconomic status so another piece of the La Jolla location is that again we don't have a lot of diversity of socioeconomic status and so we need to make some efforts to really uh, 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 push that diversity as well because uh, there may be very different processes of brain aging when you don't have the kind of access to top-notch health care or your socioeconomic status makes your whole health care system not quite as uh, robust as what we uh, enjoy here in La Jolla. So we've made outreach to um, serving seniors, which is a group that uh, does help um, uh, uh, low-income individuals, and we're working to figure out ways that we can make it easy for individuals of low socioeconomic status to be a part of our program. So we're very proud of all that, that work. And part of that is uh, really uh, a, um, the partnership that we have with our volunteers, and that's what I want to take a, a few moments right here to, uh, uh, to talk about. So I want to give special recognition to some of our most dedicated uh, volunteer partners. And if we could just go ahead and turn on the lights, because I'm going to call you up. I know, just like we did at the staff. And I call the wonderful trio of Joyce Camiel, Jane Slade, and Janelle Greenberg, if you could all come up. I'm going to talk about Phyllis in a second, but first I'm going to talk to this, this wonderful, incredible trio. So Joyce, thank you so much. She's just been fantastic all this time. Joyce and her husband, Shimon, were part of the ADRC support groups as participants since 2000 and after Shimon's passing she began co-facilitating co the caregiver support group and um, she's been donating her time volunteering at least three hours weekly for over 15 years. <laughs> the caregiver support group is typically about 25 people and Joyce supports resources and support beyond the boundaries of the group to the caregivers that need it. And Joyce also participates in our longitudinal observations. <laughs> Joyce, I'm going to give you, let's see if I've got Joyce's here. Joyce, thank you so much. We appreciate it. <laughs> now I want to talk about Jane Slade. <laughs> Jane and her husband Hank were part of the UCSD ADRC support group as participants since 2000. She continues to offer her time as a volunteer, co-facilitating the caregiver weekly support group with Joyce. And after Jane's husband Hank's passing, Jane continued her role as co-facilitated for the past 15 years. <laughs> and has become a, a truly integral part of the ADRC. Jane also provides resources and support beyond the boundaries of the group to the caregivers that need it. So, Jane. And Janelle, our newest part of this trio, uh, she started with us in 2021, having been a caregiver for her husband, Louis Body Dementia. She currently co-facilitates the weekly memory loss uh, group with Tracy. Janelle started a monthly Louis Body Caregiver Support Group once a month on Zoom in 2022. That group serves an average of 16 caregivers, and Janelle also provides resources and support beyond the boundaries of the group to the caregivers that need it. She also helps out in the office making calls for the recruitment team and the longitudinal study. Thank you so much, Janelle. Thank you so much. All Thank of you. you. <laughs> I want to talk about uh, Phyllis Munoz. Is she here? 
Is Phyllis here? Yes. Oh, yes. wonderful. <laughs> Phyllis has been volunteering at least three hours a week for the Latino and Oracles for the past five years. Phyllis completes outreach and engagement calls in Spanish for our Latino and Oracles, uh, enhancing the turnaround time for potential participants, participants and minimizing phone tag for our staff, saving us a great deal of time. <laughs> 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 you want to get one more? I don't know. We're looking at that. All right. Well, thank you so much. Can I say one thing? Yes, absolutely. Come on over. Yep. I just want to also recognize that one of the reasons why I have stayed with my volunteer work is because of the people that I interact with regularly who answer my questions about why can't I get into the system? <laughs> but Christina has been my cheerleader throughout the whole time, always saying when I'm frustrated because the population I'm targeting is a difficult population um, to encourage them to be participants in the studies. And I say, oh God, I've had a zero day every day, you know, and so and then Emily also from the very beginning has been a, a massive supporter for helping me work my way through and for all the other ladies in the office Socorro, Lily, people who are no longer there, Cynthia and Medell, um, work interacting with them and being getting to know them is one of the reasons why I stay here. It's I get a lot of support for the work that I do. So thank you very much everything that you do on behalf of finding a cure for this population. Thank you so much, all of you, Phyllis and, and others. Okay, so I thank you all. In addition, uh, we benefit greatly from your service. And I'm gonna kick off a little bit of a, a little bit of an introduction to science. You're gonna get deeper science here from Doug and and Aaron uh, in a second, but I'm going to give kind of an overview here uh, about why Alzheimer's disease and related dementias have become such a critical um, scientific endeavor to tackle. And that's part of, partly due to the changing landscape of aging that's taken place since the mid-century to now, mid-prior century, where uh, patients didn't tend to live so long back in the 650s and 60s. They would die of uh, either infections or heart disease or uh, cancers or things like that that we've now become much, much more effective at eradicating. And, uh, and yet, when individuals rise into their 80s and beyond, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's kind of a, uh, a, a, a thing that happens where you're not able to treat the kind of diseases, and that's where we're facing the more neurodegenerative processes uh, after the body's uh, illnesses have not uh, been, um, have not as curtailed the life. So by 2060, we're thinking of uh, the population being more like a pillar than a pyramid. So in the 60s, it was a population pyramid where only a few would rise to the to the level of 100 years old. But in 2060, it's thought that. Uh, many, many millions of individuals not only will be living in their 80s, but even into the uh, centurion or 100 age uh, uh, period. And with that, we need to start attacking uh, processes of, uh, you know, what is going to be affecting those individuals, which right now looks mostly like brain diseases. So you can see in 2015, there were about uh, 451,000 centenarians, those that are living to 100 and beyond, but in 2050 it's projected that it would be in about three and a half million individuals of 100 years or older uh, just within uh, the U.S. So we know that with uh, aging brings uh, brain tissue loss. That is just a fact of life that even starts in, uh, in as early as the 20s and 30s of age. Uh, that the brain tissue uh, is declining. And that becomes significant, um, particularly with neurodegenerative disease, but even without neurodegenerative disease, there is a process that changes um, 
uh, gray matter volumes or the, the cortex, the cells of the brain uh, that are um, reducing brain volume. And that's one of the markers that we're able to look at in a very precise manner now, uh, including everybody, every talk needs to now say something about AI or artificial intelligence. And we do incorporate AI into some of these um, uh, quantitative processes for assessing the brain scans that we're collecting from you. So that's really, really powerful that we have uh, computational tools that can help us uh, understand the combined impact of uh, genetics and uh, the other biomarkers they're collecting. So we do what we call cross-genome assessment across the genes that, that uh, each of our participants has inherited um, uh, from their parents. And one can look, and I've talked about this in prior, uh, prior participant uh, appreciation events, we can look and, and sum up the protective versus the deleterious genes and get a personalized uh, assessment or at least an insight into what is that individual's personalized risk. Now that's not ready for prime time yet. Again, it's one of these tools that we're using to try to understand what, uh, uh, what we should expect in this particular individual, but uh, it's just one of the things that we're collecting. The other is what I briefly alluded to, the quantitative neuroimaging directly visualizing not only the degeneration of the brain from a structural standpoint, but what proteins are uh, being deposited. And also uh, the biofluid markers that uh, Glasgow certainly leads within the nation, uh, both on the plasma side and the cerebrospinal fluid side. So as you can see, the healthy brain on the left side of the image here, nice and full with um, with spaces that are uh, packed together within the skull. But with uh, Alzheimer's dementia, we see, we start to see excessive degeneration or loss of tissue volume. And uh, the protein that characterizes the disease, amyloid, starting to build up in the gray matter of the brain. As we've talked about in the past, that is related to a different set of processing of that protein that makes it a sticky and difficult to clear protein and it, it, it tends to accumulate in the cortex of the brain and then it kicks off a cascade of events that leads to other proteins going awry and then neurodegeneration. We see that neurodegeneration very precisely with longitudinal imaging of the brain checking each brain um, uh, even yearly as much as, you know, when we do clinical trials, we scan an individual each, um, each year, and we can quantify where that change takes place. And in the center, we're gonna be more doing more and more of this. So that's something to be prepared for. In the new grant, we are getting direct funding to, uh, because of the promise of these imaging biomarkers, to actually be mandated by the NIH to start collecting more from our participants and we will be feeding back information to you as we talked about last year. So that's a new thing as well. Uh, in trying to make sure that we don't get you overly worried about some of the findings that we're seeing in the brain, but also making sure that we are both communicating about what we're seeing in the brain. Okay, that's gonna be a new thing that happens. Not only on MRI scans, but also the positron emission tomography scans, the PET scans, which are very, very powerful ways to look at what's going on in the brain. So this is the positron emission tomography scan that allows you to look at the amyloid accumulation in the brain in a quantitative fashion. And then the other uh, <clears throat> protein that's very tightly related to the neurodegeneration and the cognitive impairment, tau. So both an amyloid t uh, PET scan and tau PET scans, we will be approaching you with and asking for uh, hopefully your participation, but certainly we'll give you all the information about um, what are the risks and benefits. So uh, I probably showed you this slide before about the different uh, timeline of accumulation of these proteins. Amyloid is the first biomarker to go awry. That protein uh, starts to deposit in the brain as much as 20 years before a person has cognitive impairment. So it's a very, very early marker that, uh, that Alzheimer's disease is uh, on, uh, that, that it may be a, 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 an increased risk. And then you start to see the MRI uh, changes, the actual degeneration take place. That corresponds with the tau buildup. 
and then we start to see the cognitive impairment due to memory um, loss. Now, that was the uh, overarching kind of simplistic uh, uh, set of schematic. In we have many, many more markers now, and this is you know this is going to get even more uh, complex as we add other fluid markers and the testing that we are providing here. So again, though, the earliest markers are within the amyloid space and then progressing to tau, neurodegeneration markers, and then cognitive. Although some of our cognitive t uh, neuropsychologists would say with specified targeted testing, we may be able to shift that even earlier because when you're really looking at specific cognitive markers, it can be a very early marker as well. So all of this is still under study in terms of the timeline, but we're getting a very good sense of the progression of this disease. And then uh, Dr. Galasco, I think we'll be talking a little bit about some of the really incredible markers that are coming online for non-Alzheimer's related uh, proteinopathy, so including dementia with Lewy bodies and synuclein. These are very, uh, these have always been um, uh, diseases that have confounded most neurologists when, when, a, when they're dealing with an elderly person with cognitive impairment. It can be difficult to disentangle uh, from Alzheimer's disease, but now we're getting tools, thanks to some Doug science and others, uh, to be able to, to really uh, check objectively through the fluids to understand what proteins are going awry in the patient. So very excited about that. The power of the genome has really, and again, San Diego is the place where a lot of the genome science is being uh, advanced. I mean, we have Illumina just right down the street. We have a number of biotechnology companies that have really advanced genetic, uh, uh, um, uh, the genetic science. So the ability to assess gene expression across all cell types in the brain, again, something we can do with um, uh, the brain tissue that's given to us, gives us a whole new insight into the processes that are going on in Alzheimer's disease. So rather than just looking through a microscope, we now can actually use the power of the genome to say, well, what are the proteins and the uh, different um, molecular genetic processes that are going awry in different diseases, not just within neurons, but within every cell type within the brain. And we can use those tools, and it's kind of complex, but, but you can use those tools to distinguish, well, is this a microglia problem? Is this an astrocyte problem? Is this a neuron problem? And, uh, or is it more uh, within uh, oligodendroglias or what, whichever? So it's really a remarkable new tool set that we will apply uh, in the coming iteration. And then the finally, I think this is my last, I hope, I'm not sure if it's the last one, but, <laughs> but it's uh, uh, this concept of the skin biopsy allowing us to take uh, a bit of skin from the arm and turn that into neurons in a dish. And, and that allows us now to get a direct molecular uh, 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 set of tools to, as if we were looking right at your brain. You know, as if we were looking right at the cells of your brain, but we did it from a skin biopsy. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, really powerful. I'm very excited about it because I've always felt that our mouse models are very useful, but as I've said before, that's Mouseheimer's, that's not Alzheimer's, <laughs> okay? So use, now looking at actual human tissue, we are now looking at actual Alzheimer's processes in human cells. And this is something we will also be approaching you about, uh, hopefully getting a little skin sample biopsy in the future to allow this science to go forward. And why do we do this? Again, the promise of the future is uh, sometimes in the genetic. It, it, I'm really, really excited about genetic therapies, including these the things called antisense oligonucleotides. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but it is a way to uh, design a drug that uh, directly attacks a particular genetic uh, process that's going on. So you can actually take a little section of uh, like DNA, but attack against a, um, uh, well, an RNA pro RNA is the uh, messenger for making new proteins. And so if I can make something that's going to block specifically that RNA segment, I'm going to actually stop this protein from being uh, generated and one of the really exciting things that was just presented 
um, in the Alzheimer's Association International Conference was a uh, anti-sense oligonucleotide against tau. So one can uh, try to work on uh, reducing tau uh, protein buildup by giving an antisense oligonucleotide, and this is making it into clinical trials. And what you can see in this figure is some of the very earliest evidence that, in fact, there is a reduction in tau in the brain while they're on this antisense oligonucleotide therapy. So the, the red in this image is the tau buildup based on a PET scan. And if you look 12 months later on the right side for two different patients, both of those patients have less red in their brain, and it's really an exciting potential new route to attacking the disease. So we are on the road to neurotherapeutics and brain, brain aging. Uh, Biomarker-based improvements in diagnosis and our predictive prognosis reveals the personalized impacts of aging and the fact that many other proteins are going awry and we need to understand that process. What is the interplay between Alzheimer's disease and other protein-based neurodegeneration processes? And we need to develop in individualized therapies probably in the future. Uh, because a certain individual might have more, one, one might have more Alzheimer's disease as the process going on, one might have more Lewy body processes going on, one might have more tau, one might have, you know, many different things that they want to focus upon when you're trying to treat that individual. This progress is enabled through tremendous advances in our neurosciences research bolstered by the creative use of genetic tools and our big data science, and it highlights the value of bridging clinicians and researchers in the same environment like we do at the Shiley Marcos ADRC. And then our modular and gene and RNA-based therapies show particular new promise, and we are working on the building the infrastructure uh, for even um, putting uh, this investigation in process here at UC San Diego. So thank you so much for your attention, and thank you for your participation.